Hey, grade sevens, how you doing? You survived week one of online distance learning. And now we're in week two, and you get your very first history lesson. Yay. We're going to focus on life and society in New France. What was it like to live there? How was society structured? What kind of uh, new organizations and institutions did they create? Let's jump into it. This is what we're going to do. Step one, get yourself prepared to take some notes. So you can get a piece of line paper or you can open up the template that I created for you in Google Classroom there. You can click File up here and make a copy. And then you can type in your own notes if you want to do it that way. Or you can print this template out on your printer and then write some jot notes in. Even if you only put a couple items per box, that's more than enough. You're going to fill notes in from the lesson from my video, but you're also going to fill in some notes from your friend's presentations, okay? On the bottom, I also created a list of some of the most important key terms. By the end of grade seven, you should be able to name all of these things and tell me what they are and why they're important. What is their historical significance? So before I move on any further, I want you to hit pause on the video and get yourself set up to take some notes now. Hey, welcome back. Okay, you all ready to take some notes? Good. Second part of this lesson is going to be watching the video. You're going to watch the video that I make with some historical information. You're going to take notes as I talk. Feel free to hit pause uh, as we go. It's going to be a slightly long video, so feel free to hit pause and jot some notes down or hit pause and go take a break. Uh, and walk away from the computer for a few minutes if you feel the need to. Number three, you're going to read all the presentations that your classmates made. Now, don't complain. I know you're groaning and thinking, ah, oh, that's a lot of reading. At least you don't have to present in front of your class, right? Because that was, that was the original plan. So you got a little bit of lucky uh, and got out of that. After you're done reading all the presentation slides from your classmates, you're going to watch this mercantilism video. Finally, on Thursday, I'm going to do a short Google quiz. I'm going to post it, and you're going to answer the questions as best as you can. Don't worry, you can use your binder, and you can use your notes, and you can use your textbook. It's an open book quiz. You can even uh, jump on a phone call with your buddy, and you two, the two of you can do it at the same time and help each other out. I don't care. As long as you try your best and as long as you have watched the video and done the lesson uh, and taken some notes, you can do the quiz any way you want. So, let's get started. Before we do, why don't I start off with a bit of a history joke? There's this period in history from 400 to the 1400s in Europe. Uh, it's called the Middle Ages. Historians call it the Middle Ages, but oftentimes it's referred to as the Dark Ages. So the question is, why did they call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages? The answer, because there were a lot of knights. <laughs> uh, get it? Get it? Knights, K-N-I-G-H-T. Uh, I know you guys miss my jokes, so I miss you guys too. All right. Today we're going to answer the question, how was society structured and set up in New France? What was daily life like for the people that lived there? Remember, New France is a colony of Mother France, of the mainland France, established in present-day Canada. It was started in 1534 by the explorer Jacques Cartier, who we learned about in a previous class. Remember, Cartier was uh, one of those guys who was kind of sailing looking for new land for gold and riches but also you know enjoying a lot of the fishing and other natural resources that were available here the colony of new france reached its height or its most powerful spot or in history or its most populated time in the late 1600s and the early 1700s 
So the focus of the lesson is like in this time period where it was kind of most powerful and most successful. The location of New France is green on the map here. This is, you'll recognize this is a map of North America. Normally Canada's border is right around here where I'm moving the mouse. So you'll notice that the Canada-US border at this time was not really established. North America was still being uh, sliced up by the uh, European colonizers, France. In orange here, we have Spain. In red, we have the 13 colonies, which would then later become the United States. That's Britain. We've even got um, Dutch explorers and colonizers coming in as well. New France, as you can see in green, was quite large and extended all the way south to Louisiana, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico to where Florida is. Here's a closer zoomed look of New France uh, later on when it was only in Canadian territory. This would be sort of present day Ontario, where I'm moving the mouse. This would be present-day Quebec province. Here is an area, that's Nova Scotia there. And this is an area that was then referred to as Acadia. Oops, Acadia will become, will become very important in our next lesson of next week because something a little bit um, controversial or um, important happened there. Here's a map drawn by Jacques Cartier himself. Sorry, not Jacques Cartier, um, Samuel de Champlain. Remember after Jacques Cartier in the 1600s was uh, the explorer Samuel de Champlain came to New France, started establishing a more permanent settlement here. He was an explorer. He liked um, to lead and uh, start new, this new colony in New France, but he was also a cartographer. Cartographer. A cartographer is a professional map maker. And here we see like Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and then the uh, St. Lawrence River, Great Lakes. It's actually a pretty accurate map when you consider this guy had no GPS technology, no computers, no satellites, no drones, no cell phone. He was drawing based on location of the stars using an astrolabe, which is a tool that helps him measure using the stars. And you might recognize this little device here from math class. It's a compass. Pretty neat, huh? All right. Why Canada or why Ontario, Quebec? Why why this location for New France? Well, we talked about this before a lot. People came here from Europe because they thought they could get rich. They could make the king back in Europe rich. They thought they would just stick a shovel in the ground and find endless amounts of gold. However, they realized later on there is not much gold in Ontario and Quebec and in Eastern Canada. Second reason was religion. You're going to learn this week a lot about the Jesuit missionaries who were these special priests who came to convert or change the First Nations people from their traditional religions into a Christian Catholic religion. The goal of these missionaries, a missionary, by the way, is somebody who leaves their home to go to a new land or a new area or a different country to try and spread their religion to other people. So one of the big reasons why New France even started in the first place was because the Jesuit priests, the Jesuit missionaries wanted to make a new Catholic community here. They wanted to come and teach the First Nations people all about the Catholic faith, about Jesus Christ, teach them about the Bible. And their goal was to change them, was to convert them 
to become believers in those ideas. And that's very, I mean, at the time, I think they were doing what they thought was right. But now we look back and we realize that they were really trying to assimilate them. Assimilation or to assimilate somebody is to sort of forcibly try to change somebody from their culture to your culture. We look back at that now as historians and we know that, you know, it could, you can consider it a bad thing. Um, they were doing it for what they thought was a good thing, a good reason. And we look back now and we know that's one of the main reasons why New France was successful as it was because of religion. The third reason is fur. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, this in grade six. The fur trade was an important reason why Europeans came to North America was to kill beavers and use their fur to make hats. It's a very fashionable item in Europe at the time. And lastly, we've got excellent farmland in New France or in Canada. So anyone wanting to start a new life could always jump on a boat from France, start a farm in the new land. All right, who was living in New France? Seigneurs. A seigneur was somebody who had power and wealth and was sort of in charge of a small area of farms. And the system that they would establish was called a seigneury. Seigneuries were long areas of land along the main waterway. They were divided up into smaller pieces and farms. A seigneur would keep a small portion of the seigneury system for himself, but he had to get other families to farm the land. Those people were called the habitants, and they would settle on the land. So here's a map of what it might have looked like. Here you've got the St. Lawrence River and these long rectangular grids are family, like each one belongs to a family. They have access to the river here. And then they would farm all the way over here. Access to the river was important. You needed drinking water. You needed to water your crops and your livestock animals. But also you needed to access the water for transportation. Here you'll notice the seigneur's home is much larger than everyone else. Uh, his plot of land would have been much larger. And by the way, he collected taxes from all the other farmers who lived in the area. He might take uh, a portion of their crops every year or uh, cash. The happy tongue were like the regular everyday folk, the farmers, the hard workers, the people who didn't have access to a lot of money and did not have a lot of land. They were the farming families who worked hard to maintain the land. They would grow crops, raise animals, but they had to share a portion of their crop with the seigneur. They also worked for 10 days every year without any pay for the seigneur. And then they also had to pay taxes, money to the church and to the government, to try to keep the church running. Who's going to, who's going to feed the priest? If the priest is in the, in the church uh, all day, someone needs to feed that priest. So the habitant would all pitch in to, to feed the priests and the nuns. Here's some historical images. I like this image because it shows the trees being chopped down. Um, at the time, we would have been completely covered in boreal forest. Uh, so it was really, really hard work for these guys who came, and these families, cutting down the trees, removing the roots and the stumps, and farming the land. Remember, all of this was done by hand. There were no tractors. There were no chainsaws. There were no excavators. It was all done by hand. Who else was living here? Well, there was a special group of uh, women called the Fil du Roi. And this translates to daughters of the king. There was one major problem in New France. All the farmers were coming, a lot of them being single men. There were not enough single women. And if you pay attention to your health class teacher, 
you would know that you need a man and a woman to procreate and make babies. So if the colony was to succeed, to grow, families were to grow, we needed more women in New France. So the king of France actually would offer to young women who were orphans, uh, they would give uh, a free transport to New France, give them a little bit of money to pay a dowry, and ship them off to New France to marry the farmers there. Here's a painting of some fils du roi getting on the boat, getting ready to sail off to their new adventure. Who else lived here? There were a lot of people who worked for the church, the Jesuit priests and missionaries that I spoke about before, the Ursuline nuns. A nun in a church system is a woman who lives in the church and who helps run the church and who helps the community and teaches the community. They actually opened Canada's first school for girls. And then there were the bishop and the clergy. These guys were like the leaders in the church. They would make decisions based on what was best for the church in the area. The Jesuit missionaries built this very famous settlement called St. Marie among the Huron. It's a historic site still there today. You can go visit a lot of classes, go on a field trip and visit. And you can see the church that they built there, the long houses that were there where the First Nations people would have lived. St. Marie among the Huron, uh, that word Huron is a word that they used to describe the First Nations people. That was a name they gave to the First Nations people. But the, those that group of people, those, those Huron people, they actually referred to themselves as the Wendat people. The Wendat people lived all over Ontario and all over North America. That's why in Stouffville we have a school called Wendat Village Public School. So when you see that term Huron, in your textbook or in your notes, it's actually talking about the Wendat. There's a very famous story about what happened here at St. Marie among the Huron, which we will get to at a later date. There were also people called the Courier de Bois. The Courier de Bois were people who left the colony of New France to trade with the different trappers and the fur traders in the back country or out in the, in the middle of nowhere, basically. They, operated illegally without a license. And there was a good number of them. They would go out and collect fur and, and interact with the First Nations people, and learn their language. Here's a painting that was done to depict the exchange of trade or trade of furs between a First Nations person and a European. You'll notice there's a little bit of sort of um, misrepresentation happening here. The painter depicts this European bearded fellow here as noble, standing with a nice stature, confident, and you've got a First Nations here, person here kind of looking um, more like a caveman or kind of slouched over and doesn't look very intelligent. Now this painter is trying to depict this idea of a racial hierarchy where at the time it was actually believed that the European people were smarter and more important than the First Nations people. Remember at the time there was a lot of racism. It was very normal um, to them to believe that there was a sort of people who were better than others and they gave the First Nations people derogatory terms like they called them savages for example they thought everything they did was backwards and unintelligent which is obviously not true we know now that they just were different and that's all the handshake here is also interesting because it depicts um, an economic exchange or an agreement and that would have been the fur trade the First Nations people living in New France and around New France came from a lot of different First Nations groups. Montagnier, Cree, Algonquin, Huron-Wendat, and the Iroquois. There was a huge rivalry between the Wendat, Huron, 
and the Iroquois. They were sworn enemies. They hated each other. And there were many, many wars fought. And in fact, the Wendat Huron and the Iroquois would actually use the French to try and gain an upper hand in these wars and these battles. And they would try to manipulate the French to trade with them. Give us guns and we will fight. That sort of stuff. Later on, as the First Nations people, usually First Nations women, would marry European men and start having a family, the, the babies would be half French or half European and half First Nations. And we call that the Métis. Métis. That's a very important word. I want you to make sure you write that down. Métis. It's not, um, it's a silent S. It's not pronounced. Uh, that And these people still live in Canada to this day. There is a lot of Métis population in Alberta, in Manitoba, in Saskatchewan. Something that you need to, to write down, please. So how was the government in, uh, organized? There were two different hierarchies or two different levels. Uh, the civil hierarchy, which is like the people and the government. And their religious hierarchy, which is the church. In the civil hierarchy, I want you to take a look at this graphic here. You don't have to memorize it. You just have to understand that the king, the viceroy, and the minister, these are people who sort of are in charge. And then you've got this governor. The governor is sort of making decisions for New France in New France. Remember, the king is back in France. And then you've got the intendant. The intendant is sort of like your police chief security sort of guy who makes rules and makes sure that the laws are obeyed. And then you've got the citizens at the bottom. It's important to note that I think, I think these people who came to New France, they really wanted to make a new life of a better place, a new world, but really they just kind of copied the same old problems of the old world, which is that you have your rich and you have your poor and you have your powerful and you have your uh, silent majority of people. The governor himself was like a symbol of the king. He was expected to act like a king, so he would throw these big parties and dances and balls, and he was sort of responsible for what was happening in New France. Uh, remember, the king is ultimately in charge, but communication between New France and Europe, the European France and the king, would take a long, long time. Because remember, you'd have to write a letter, put it on a boat, wait the three, uh, two to three months for the boat to sail across the ocean, get a response, and then sail the letter back two months later. It would take half of a year just to get an answer from the king. Are we allowed to build a fence? Well, you don't want to wait six months to build a fence and get an answer from the king. So you had the governor. He was kind of like the, the king's stand-in in Canada. There was a famous governor named Count Frontenac. You can hit pause and read that if you wish. All right, here's the religious hierarchy, the church's hierarchy. You've got the bishop at the top. He's in charge of a huge district or diocese. You've got the clergy. These are the people who, a clergy member is anybody who works and lives with the church. And then you've got lay organizations. A lay organization is like a religious institution or organization that is run by people who are not in the clergy. Lay just meaning regular, everyday people. People that were part of this religious hierarchy were actually quite important at this time. They were among the only people, maybe except for the governor and the, some of the other rich elite people. The bishop, the priests, the, the missionaries, and some of the nuns, they were the only people who actually knew how to read and write. They were the only time you had people who had the time to become educated. So they were actually quite important members of their community. And you also have to remember at this time, religion was extremely important. I want you to think about your own life. Religion may play a role in your life, may not. But think about your social media and your internet and your Netflix. How important that is to you. Now triple that. That's how important religion was to them. It was a big part of their life. Gathering at the church every uh, Sunday for mass, 
for example, would have been a huge part of their week. It would have been the only part of their week where they kind of didn't have to work, didn't have to work the farm and the land. And they also got to see other members of the community exchange greetings, meet new friends, visit old friends, um, exchange news about upcoming things, a wedding, for example. Church would have been an extremely important part of their social routine, as well as part of their religious life. Okay, making money in New France. Remember, money was a huge reason why they came here in the first place. Fish and furs especially, once they realized that gold wasn't really going to work here. It wasn't going to pan out. With the economy, there's a system called mercantilism and triangular trade. I want you to pay attention to that when you get to those um, presentations, and I want you to watch the video that I posted to YouTube about mercantilism. I'm not going to talk about it here. And there we have it. All right, so we're done section two. I know it's a bit of a longer video. I apologize. There was a lot to cover, though. Now, go and read. Uh, first, probably take a break, but then go and read all the presentations from your classmates and continue to take notes. Watch the mercantilism video and check back on Thursday for the quiz. Good luck, grade sevens, and let me know if you have any questions. Send me an email.